We've been dealing last time and tonight and perhaps next time with the things that characterize mature disciples, the qualities of character. We've invited you to grade yourself to see if you're a disciple, to see if you are maturing in discipleship. Remember, there are no degrees of discipleship. You're either totally committed to Jesus or you're not. But there are degrees of maturity, and it's Christ's desire in calling you as a disciple to be mature like him. Luke 6.40 is the theme for our studies, remember. The disciple is not above the teacher, but he that is fully mature will be like his teacher, referring to himself. The same goal for salvation and discipleship is set forth in Ephesians 4, 11 and following, where he tells us the fivefold ministry has been set in the church to bring us to the mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, what will characterize those who will be like their teacher, like Jesus? Well, the answer is to be found in his teachings on discipleship, central passage where he teaches discipleship, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. We've already dealt with that in the Deeper Life book and tapes and ethics. And so what we're looking at now is some fresh insights in the first 12 verses. These are qualities of character that we should have. And we'll have if we're maturing. Now, we saw two of them last time and a few more tonight and then next week. But mature disciples will have these qualities. Verse 3, they'll be poor in spirit. To remind you of what we covered last time. Humble, lowly, all summed up, we could say, teachable. In contrast to those who are spiritually self-sufficient, at least they think they are, and they hate the thought that they have to learn anything or that they would not have all the light yet that God wants them to have or they could have, and so they're proud and independent. I'm sure you've met some along the way. I have. Then in verse 4, he said, Blessed are they that mourn. Now, most people don't think of mourning as a blessing, but he says it is. Godly sorrow, contrition, over your own finite imperfections as well as this world and the terrible sinful state of sin in these end times mourning over that does it grieve you to have to sit in well not the barber shop I go to but <laughs> I've been in some where it grieves you just have to sit there and listen to some of the conversation or wherever you go you know whether you're talking about drug addicted people driving down the highway or just raw, naked sensuality confronting you everywhere, from advertising to, well, the drive-in. I don't want to go into the details. You have eyes for yourself. But this sinful world, does it grieve you? Are you mourning? As well as grieving, mourning over the low spiritual condition of the church. Mourning in contrast to those who believe they've arrived spiritually, no further room or need for growth. Ever met any of those? You can't teach them anything? Those who indulge in this world's ways rather than mourning about the low spiritual condition and ethical condition of everything from the bank to where you work. Instead of mourning, supporting the shallow humanistic religious systems, as we've said. Now the promises, to remind you again, for the poor in spirit or the meek and lowly he says will be the kingdom of heaven then he says for they that mourn who are contrite of heart grieved because of sin the promise is they shall be comforted so it's a blessing to mourn he said blessed if you mourn blessed is the mourning why because you'll be comforted but as we pointed out without contrition there can be no comfort some will never know his comfort because there's no contrition. So many are deceiving themselves that they're disciples. You may think you're a disciple, but do we meet these qualities, these qualifications? It's serious. We ought to re-examine our, not profession of faith, but our profession of discipleship. 
I think by now that a person in faith assembly ought to know whether or not he or she is saved. See if we really have influence as salt and light, verses 13 and 14. Are you the light of the world? He says you ought to be. Ye are the light of the world. Philippians 2, we shine as lights in this wicked, crooked generation. We're supposed to. But if we act like everyone else, in other words, we're not even peacekeepers, let alone peacemakers, demanding our rights and so forth, then are we disciples? Well, I hope you've got a Bible and open because it's all here. Let's turn to verse 5 tonight. We dealt with those things last time. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They're going to inherit the world, this earth. Now, that's New Testament. That's not Old Testament Israel and her promise of a little piece of the earth. But this is to the church, his disciples. If we are meek, we will inherit the earth. God, help me to be meek. God, help me to be meek. (laughs) You ever hear yourself crying out? Especially if you missed it somewhere. Did you ever miss it anywhere? Did you ever give them back what they gave you and twice as much? You got them told. You settled that question. They'll never bother you again. No, they won't. Maybe the Lord won't either, so you have to watch out. But the meek stand in contrast to those who are proud, aggressive, always on the watch to make sure everything comes their way, the way they want it, you know, demanding their rights and their privileges. And always demanding what belongs to them as well as maybe what belongs to you. They're demanding their rights and yours. And all you have to do is drive down the highway and you know of which you speak. If you're not a driver, this one will go past you maybe. But it seems half the drivers anymore are demanding not only their half, but your half. And you better get out of their way. They're demons possessing these drivers. It's something about when you get behind the wheel, this is my machine and that's my highway. Get out of the way. I've had them spit at me. I've heard of cases where if you don't get out of the way, they'll run you off the road and then get a gun out and shoot you. But how many, you know, take their half and yours? So this is what characterizes the world. Not meek, not humble, not... Well, if I just knew you wanted my half too, I would gladly move on park. Once I did, I just pulled off the side of the road and waved them on. That's the best way to do. Maybe not wave them on. They might take an arm with it if they can. (laughs) But just pull over. Some of these truckers, you know, that breathe down your throat with that 2,000 horsepower diesel or whatever. But I'm not just talking about truckers. I was in Fort Wayne recently and... These are the ones that really test your mettle to see if you're meek, to see if you're really a disciple. The light, just the instant it turns green, then they press not on the accelerator, but the horn. I mean, this happens constantly. It's not some big bully of a man that's, get out of my way. It's these young women driving. Just happened recently. I mean, you watch the light and you're ready to go. And before I could even react, my foot was already down on the accelerator. Beep, 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 because I had one of these motorized roller skates. And the smaller they are, the faster they go because they got all this horsepower on a roller skate. You ever notice those little ones weaving in and out? But anyway, I look back, you know, you thought it was the president at least or the governor. And some female office worker, and when I looked in the mirror, she was going... You know, she wasn't kidding. You get out of my way. So, praise the Lord for the grace. I just went on like I would if she hadn't blown and just got out of her way. I'm saying people are always demanding not only their rights. You see, my right was I was in first position at the light. There's nowhere she could go except through me (laughs) or over me. And so she was demanding my position. I would have gladly given it to her. And this has happened on more than one occasion. You better believe it. But the medical profession, businessmen, homeowners, because the world has this spirit of aggressiveness, not humility and meekness, they have to spend thousands of dollars unnecessarily for 
protection against lawsuits that, well, 20 years ago they wouldn't have thought of. Like doctors now are always being sued for malpractice if they can't perform a miracle of healing every time. And businessmen, you know, if somebody buys a, well, the world calls them TV dinners, I just call them frozen junk dinners <laughs> that you heat and eat in 20 minutes, has been thawed two or three times, as sometimes happens if the power goes off. The power goes off in the city for half a day. What do you suppose happening in the supermarkets? Do you ever think of that when you buy that frozen junk? But anyway, and then they get sick. They sue the store. They sue the driver of the truck. They sue the clerk. And they have to carry tens of thousands of dollars of insurance because people are not meek. That world is not meek out there, in case you haven't heard it. And we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to give them an example. If they want to blow you off the highway, just get over. And sometimes you're in a strange city that you don't know you can turn a right on a red at that particular corner. But John Doe, he's turning there every day at 4.30 and... Oh, he gets upset. If you're waiting on the red light to change, you dummy, don't you know you can turn right? Well, maybe I'm not even going right. I'm going straight, but i got to turn right to please him. <laughs> and you have to watch yourself because it is serious. I mean, I pray the Lord help me not to react like they are acting every time because demons are possessing them, these aggressive, demanding their rights people. Friends will go into a home to have dinner and trip over a rug and turn their ankle or trip up the steps or down and break a leg and they will sue their host. That happens all the time. That's just the way the world conducts itself. So on every hand, people demanding their rights, strikes, demonstrations, petitions, constantly going on. Teacher strikes. All you have to do is turn on the radio. That's all you get. Teacher strikes. And then they wonder why the students don't respect their authority and rebel against the school authority and parental authority. It's because they've got a good example of rebellion in their parents and in their teachers and in their leaders. So what I'm saying, everybody, and I hope not this church, so almost everybody is demanding his little portion of this world as his right, what belongs to him. Get out of my way. This part of the highway is mine. I'm going to town. Get off the road. <laughs> Whatever they're demanding with their strikes and petitions, they're demanding their little portion of this world. When Jesus said, the meek who demand nothing are going to get it all in the end. That's what he said, didn't he? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what everybody's aggressively trying to obtain. The earth. As meek, we're not... Demanding anything. And we're going to get it all in the end. The whole earth. What part do you want? Well, it's ours. It'll all belong to you. But the world, I'm not telling you anything new when I say this, hates meekness. Hates it. Despises it. They think a person has a backbone like a jellyfish who is meek. Heart like a marshmallow. Backbone like jello. They hate anything that even suggests meekness. They respect only power. You see, the administration now will get somewhere for a while with Russia because that's all Russia respects is power. Now, I'm just talking about the political scene. The Christian knows what his responsibility is, not to get involved in the moral majority politics, but to pray, to pray for the governments. But anyway, that's another subject. But... This world out here respects only power, respects those who are as strong or stronger than themselves. Especially do they respect people who are stronger. They've got a little what they call clout. This is why aggressive sports are so popular. Because you see, the spectators can participate vicariously. And so when they watch that boxing contest and one boxer knocks another into a state of stupidity or unconsciousness, I think they call it punch drunk, then you see the spectator, he enjoys that because that is he in there who is doing to his opponent that he could never defeat in the world. So he participates vicariously like a mother does, you know seeing their children play their first duet at school on the piano or whatever, and so on. Or play the Easter Bunny in somebody's play at Easter. <laughs> she can never get two lines straight, you know, in school. 
could hardly read. And she participates vicariously. But in the case of aggressiveness, you see this in all those aggressive sports where the spectator sees himself there. And you have to watch. I mean, don't watch it, but you have to watch (laughs) that when you do learn or hear of something like that, that you're not putting yourself in there as the one. You see, when one boxer knocks another into state of, I said, unconsciousness, that's you getting back at that policeman who dressed you down and gave you that ticket the other day that you didn't deserve, you thought. Or you're getting back at that bully back in your youth, teenage days, or maybe you're still there, that beat you up at school. Or maybe that's the bully at work or the intolerable neighbor. I'm saying human nature being what it is, spectator sports are popular for that reason. Like when a tackler or tacklers make mincemeat out of the fullback. People enjoy that because you can fantasize. You couldn't hold on to a pass. You tried to make the football team in high school. You could never hold on to a pass. But boy, when he receives that and makes a touchdown... And then you turn it around and when they break a couple of legs and at least three ribs and give him a concussion, see, you're getting back. You didn't make the team, but now you just made it. Now, you know what I'm speaking about. If you don't, you're either asleep or not alive. You have to watch that old, and I'm not talking about we have the old nature and the new, that doctrine of two natures, but you have to watch that old human inclination to want to get back or get even. Now, you analyze that. You can write a book on it. Why spectator sports, especially in America, are so popular. It's because they're so brutal. And Ronald Reagan, the present administration, was elected. One of the basic reasons, not just economic, though that was major, was because he talked a tough campaign. And he appointed as his Secretary of State, not somebody that had a marshmallow heart and head, but a general, I mean, and a tough one. The liberals are just climbing the wall every time anybody mentions the name of General Haig or Secretary of State Haig. But from a political standpoint, military standpoint, the Bible says to pray for the leaders and honor the leaders, fear the leaders and all. But there's nothing in the Bible that says unregenerate nations have to be weak because in that case, meekness would be weakness. But that's another story. The point is, people elected the present administration because, well, human nature being what it is, they hate the very appearance of meekness which to them is spineless weakness. But on the contrary, the scriptures show us that it's the aggressive who are weak and the meek who are strong. Why does God say the meek are strong? And he does in the Bible. And that the strong are weak because the meek are manifesting self-control at its highest in every situation. You see, a person who doesn't retaliate reciprocate when they're reviled or hurt or mistreated or lied about or slandered and they just maintain an even smiling meek and humble lowly spirit that is strength because it's a demonstration of self-control at its highest level anybody can get upset and slander and abuse and take people to court I've got Proverbs 16.32, that the self-controlled man or woman is the strong one. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Let me run that by you again. He that is slow to anger, the meek person, is better than a mighty man, greater. And he that can rule his spirit is greater than he that can conquer a city. See, meekness, according to the word of God, is no milk and water virtue of spineless people. Because you see examples in the Bible of strong leaders who were meek. What's said of Moses in Numbers 12? Moses, we are told, was the meekest man on this earth until Jesus came. And yet he was the leader of that great nation, God's chosen nation of Israel. Of all the people he could have chosen, he chose the meekest man on earth, who wouldn't even defend himself to his own sister or brother. Well, who do you think you're talking to? Because I married the Ethiopian woman. He could have said, I'm the leader of Israel. I can do what I want, especially if God approves it. He did not even reply, did not even defend himself. Meek. And what did he do in the golden calf incident? 
He was no mouse. When he came down and saw what they were doing, he, in his anger, broke the Ten Commandment tablets, and God didn't fuss with him over that. He just wrote them again for him. God's the one that told him what they were doing down there. He said, get thee down. These people have already disqualified themselves, committing abomination. And he came down, we're told he ground up the golden calf into powder, sprinkled it on the waters, and said, now you rebels, get out on your hands and knees and drink. And they did. That's about three million. No, meekness isn't weakness. He's the meekest man on earth, we're told. Scripture says that. Inspired scripture. And yet when you see him in action, he's not weak. And Jesus is called a lamb, the lamb of God. Now what's more timid and delicate than a little lamb? Not a sheep, goat, matured, you know, in the sense that they're big and aggressive, but a little lamb. And yet you seem as the lion of Judah when he drives out the defilers of his house, the temple. But somehow, he is so meek and humble. He said of himself he was. I would like to have been there and seen that righteous indignation at work. So Jesus' disciples were saying will be characterized as those who stand in contrast to the prevailing attitude and spirit of this world, this age, which follows the philosophy, stand up for your rights. But Scripture shows that if you're a disciple of Jesus, if we're maturing, when we are insulted and slandered, we'll not justify ourselves any more than Moses did. He was insulted and slandered by his own family. If we're mistreated, and abused, we will not defend ourselves. If we are reviled, we will not reciprocate. If we're smitten on one cheek, he says we'll turn the other. If they take away our goods by the courts or stealing them, either way, we won't threaten litigation or call the police and... Catch that thief and lock him up. Jesus said, no, just if you find him, ask him if he's warm enough with my coat because I've got an overcoat here too. That's what he said. Oh, that's why people don't like people who teach on the Sermon on the Mount. It's so contrary to human nature. But it's like him. On the universe and came down here and they wouldn't let him have anything. He said, foxes have holes, but he says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The birds of the air have nests. And so, while the disciples of Jesus are meek, they're not weak. Because they will not defend one iota of their own property or rights. They just assume they have none. They're meek. But they're not weak because while they won't defend one thing that they possess or own or belongs to them, even character, name, or whatever, they don't have to justify when they're falsely accused. Yet they won't surrender or compromise a jot or tittle of what belongs to God. That is His Word, truth. They will contend earnestly for the faith. They're meek, but not weak. They won't defend their own rights, their personal rights, but they'll not yield one iota of God's rights with respect to His truth earnestly contend for the faith, would rather die than compromise. It's the aggressive, the person who's always standing up for his rights and others. I'm thinking of religious leaders who are always standing up for social rights for someone else. We have Proverbs 25, 28 that tells us that the aggressive and uncontrolled who are always demanding their rights are weak in the sight of God. Listen to it. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city, broken down and without walls. Now, nothing is more devastated than a city that has been conquered and destroyed, the buildings leveled and the city burned, like Jericho. Think of Jericho. And the walls fell down flat. There was nothing but a heap left. The children of Israel got done with it. That's how God sees you. As nothing, just a heap of rubbish 
Unless we can control our spirits. I'll read it again. He that has no rule over his tongue, his attitude, his thoughts, his spirit, is like a city destroyed without walls. Now, which one of those verses pertain to you? We read you Proverbs 16.32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty man, and he that rules his spirit greater than he that takes a city. Does that characterize you or this verse? He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Solemn thoughts. God views us as either greater than the person who can destroy a city or like a destroyed city based solely on what our attitude is, our reactions day to day. I hope that he has touched you at the right place. Again, the meek are those who willingly, as well as humbly, submit to the will of God when they learn it in his word. They don't quarrel with the minister or with you, the church member, when you witness to them about the word. How many times you tried to witness to your family, your neighbors, those at work, and all they've got is a quarrel, opposition. I mean, even if they didn't agree with your baptism, the Holy Spirit, divine healing, doctrine, whatever. If they thought faith assembly was out in orbit somewhere, so far from what they thought truth was. Yet if they were true disciples, they would be meek. And I have seen demonstrated out of people who oppose, well, myself and the message, not just this church, but other pastorates where we tried to stay with the word of God and not man's creed. Where if, you know, they disagreed with you, it looks like they would try to teach me the right way. But instead of that, it's aggressiveness, hate, vindictiveness, slander, lies, half-truths. Which only proves to me they're not disciples. I'm just saying, if a person is wrong and you're dealing with him, you know, on a one-to-one, it's not the same as contending earnestly for the faith where you're not contending with people but defending the faith in your message and your teaching. That's another story. You just tell it like it is. But when you're dealing with a person, well, Second Timothy 2, where Paul said to instruct them in meekness. Be patient with them as you try to talk to them. But the meek, we're saying, will humbly and willingly submit to the truth when they hear it through the word. They won't raise a wall of opposition. But there's such hate in this religious world. I'm not talking about the unsafe community out there, no. But there's such hate of the full gospel. There's such hate and rebellion against the whole truth of the word of God, that just the mention of a minister's name who teaches the whole truth. Well, like myself, just the mention of my name, our faith assembly where you attend, just for you to mention that, causes a reaction and opposition by charismatics and non-charismatics alike. They fly into a rage. I don't mean everyone, but I mean enough have and manifest everything but a meek spirit. It's a vindictive spirit. And it's strange that I've found that half the time, if you live in this area, you just have to live in this area of Indiana, and you don't report a robbery because you follow Matthew 5, you know, just don't worry about it. Use your faith and he'll give it back or provide for your needs. Some stuff I don't even care if I get back. I said, say, one movie camera. I was, you could say, semi-professional. And it's a semi-professional camera used by professionals. And my point is, one camera was 3500 Then, I don't know what it costs now. The lens alone was $1,250. I'm not running down to buy another. I don't care if I get it back. But all I'm saying is, if I want it back, all I'd have to do is claim it, and he would give me one better, because it would be newer. And I don't want to digress too far, but the one I had... Bless their heart, they may not know it, and then wonder what that is in the lens. There's a hair in the lens. $1,250 lens with a big horse hair from cleaning brush inside. Sent it back to the factory. By the way, that has a whole lot to say about quality control. I just bought a new electric razor. You have to take it back. It won't take a charge. And on and on and on and on and on. And every time I go to start my car, praise God, it's a Lincoln. It takes, roam, roam. well, about five minutes of that, sounds like to start and my wife's jeepster 
starts us like that. So I've got this big Lincoln quality control. Took it in to tune it up, and well, <laughs> you say, well, it ran better before, but there's a hair in that lens. Sent it off to have them remove it to the factory, and that's a long, what, two month process because it's a Swiss camera, the best Bolex, the best up to that point. It comes back, the hair is still there. So I just shake it down to the bottom and say, so what? Because I'm just shooting through the center of the lens. Anyway. Well, whoever's got it may not know, and that hair will get, you know, across there, and they'll think they've got a telephone wire in their pictures or taken. But I couldn't care less about the $3,500 camera. But if I wanted it, then faith's the way, is what we're saying. But let me get back to what I was saying. Half the time in this area of Indiana, maybe the whole state could be included, but I know around this area, encompassing several miles, if you don't report a robbery, we've had two and didn't, or if your child tells the teacher at school that she doesn't believe in Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, or the witches on Halloween and doesn't want to participate, or if you were in an accident and said, take me home, you know, a tree falls on you or whatever, take me home, you got to sign a paper to go home. If a wife occasionally loses a baby at home where the doctor, you know, they're losing them all the time in the hospital by the dozens, but because he wasn't in charge of your losing the baby. You know the first thing they ask you? Where do you go to church? Where do you go to church? What's they got to do with not celebrating Christmas or believing in Easter bunnies because bunnies don't lay eggs? Have you ever tried to figure that one out? I get eggs and Easter bunnies together, but that's about as stupid as trying to figure out the Christmas tree on Jesus' birth. What's that got to do with birth? But... They say, where do you go to church? Because they expect you to say in this area, encompassing several miles, faith assembly. Now, there's no other state in America that would ever think to ask anyone who didn't believe in Santa Claus or who wanted to be taken home if he was injured and trust God for healing. There's not a state in America that would ask you where you go to church. <laughs> They do all the time here. People always tell me, they say, the first question they ask is, where you go to church? I say, what's that got to do with the situation you're involved in? Where you go to church? They don't ask anybody else that. If you say, well, that's my religious belief, they may say, oh. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness and a Mormon, or especially a Roman Catholic, that generally settles the matter. Those are my religious convictions. That settles it. Even to the chief of police, Roman Catholic, wow. Mormon, they expect them to be a little off color religiously. Jehovah's Witness, that settles it. But not if you say, not those are my religious convictions, but my Christian convictions based on the Word of God. And then you start citing a verse of Scripture, they'll stop you right in the middle of that verse. Don't you preach to me. I don't want any of your religion shoved down my throat. And then if you add the additional insult of attending faith assembly you can finish that little scenario yourself you know how to come out but where would you go in this world to ask you where you go to church if the child says I don't believe that bunnies lay eggs and has anything to do with the resurrection or if you don't pay allegiance to a secular kingdom when you say no I can only pledge allegiance to Jesus he's my savior as sometimes is required where do you go to church and not just around here, it's been reported to me by others, and I remember one just recently, in other states where they have gone, and some of you report this sort of thing, you go somewhere and witness or begin to practice your beliefs. People are asking now, do you happen to know a minister by the name of Hobart Freeman? <laughs> I mean, in other states, friends. And if you say yes, I do know him, and I have read his literature, or sat under his ministry, or listened to his tapes. You become a Freemanite, you're slandered, you're abused, you're opposed, and rather than a meek spirit, that Christian rises up, you can see the horns and the fire and the brimstone. Vindictive, not meek. Just because you mentioned my name. Now, you can put yourself in there, it just happens to be the way it is. <laughs> Well, of course, they're some kind of a knight. 
if their name's Jones and they don't believe anything. I can hear God for myself. I don't need an intermediary, a secondary. I'm going to the source. I don't follow any man. If their name's Jones, then they're a Jonesite. They're following themselves. Or actually, they're following that invisible spirit. But anyway, Jesus' disciples are characterized as those who will be teachable, they will submit to those in authority over them, whether it's parents, police, government, ministerial. And then those that they are over, you know, somewhere along the line, you have people under you, even if it's your own children. Or where you work, you may have people that haven't been there as long as you. You've at least got seniority if you're not their supervisor. And so in cases where you are in authority, then you will condescend to serve others. That's the meek spirit. You submit to authority that's over you, meekly, and you serve others who are under you. Now, I don't mean this that I'm over you except in the Lord, in a role of leadership. But I can honestly say, I can say without any fear of contradiction, that I see myself as the description of 1 Peter 5. Not lording it over the flock, but your servant. Some people need to hear it. Don't ever mistake meekness for weakness, whether it's myself or somebody else in the body, some other minister, because we may approach something meekly. Don't mistake that as in the case of Moses for weakness. I don't mean a comparison there, but just to point to me. So we will meekly submit to authority, and if we're in authority, we will meekly serve. So meekness is our strength. In meekness lies our strength. You see, the meek heart will never be ruffled by the insults of little men because a meek heart is a big heart. The meek heart is too big to be ruffled by the insults and abuses of little men. Men who are like cities broken down without walls. You'll find if you'll cultivate meekness, the meek person is never at the mercy of every mortal who wants to mar his mind to peace. The meek are never at the mercy of every mortal who wants to mar his peace. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, listen to what our teacher said were to be like him, what he said of himself. Matthew eleven twenty nine, I am meek and lowly of heart. And then in Luke 6.40, he said, He that's fully matured, perfect, will be like me, like his teacher. Now, if the Son of God, who could just, with a wave of his hand, wipe out and destroy his enemies, says of himself, I am meek and lowly. That's the character of God. All-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, perfect in all of his ways. Who doesn't have to put up with any abuse or opposition. He could snuff out agnostics and atheists with just a wave of his hand. Like you would snuff out the life of a fly with a fly sweater. But when the disciples wanted to do that to those who didn't appreciate who they were in Samaria, he said, Call down fire from heaven like Elijah to destroy the Samaritans because they won't receive me and this message that will save their souls? You don't know what spirit you have. Son of man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save. Call down fire from heaven like Elijah to destroy the Samaritans because they won't receive me and this message that will save their souls? You don't know what spirit you have. Son of man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save. You see, God in heaven, spirit, can't be tempted to sin. So he's never tempted to act like some of us might act in haste. But the Son of Man here on earth, you see, is in his humanity. And that's a temptation he had to overcome. He could do what he wanted with his enemies. And he wept over them. That's what you should do. Jesus wept over Israel. We should weep over the church and the world. Well, verse 6 is another quality. If you're a mature disciple, it will be true of you. 
that you have a hunger and thirst, not for food, but for righteousness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The promise is they shall be filled. The use is significant of the two terms. Because, you know from experience, if you've gone all day and got too busy to stop by the time supper comes around, you are hungry and thirsty, especially if you've been working out in the yard in the sun. Or if you've been fasting, you know what it is. When the fast is ended, or before sometimes, to be hungry and thirsty. And his choice of these terms is significant. He didn't say, blessed are those who desire to be righteous, or desire righteousness. But he says, you're blessed if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Now, it just could be that some of you, we've already lost you on this one. You don't know what it is to hunger and thirst after righteousness because churches are overflowing with people who are satisfied with box mix religion being entertained with little religious talks and sermonettes on Sunday morning and a robed choir and an organ playing the funeral marches that you hear in the churches hungering and thirsting Not for programs, not for religious programs, busyness in church work, being satisfied with that, but hungering and thirsting to be like God. Righteous. Righteousness, his holy character, conduct. The disciple of Jesus who wants to mature is not going to be satisfied with just what most are satisfied with. A little religion once a week. But they hunger and thirst, not after religion, not after a supernatural ministry, not after the gifts. They may desire them, and it's good to desire some of those things. He says, desire the best gifts. But they hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not like you hunger and thirst between your three meals a day if you eat three times a day, as most do. And you can get pretty hungry if you work between breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner. But hunger and thirst like if you were shipwrecked and out in a lifeboat on an open sea for several days without food and water. You would hunger and thirst. And you either know what he's talking about here or you don't, but you won't be blessed unless you've already found yourself hungering and thirsting. I don't know how you'd work it up. I don't know what you should pray, Lord, help me to hunger and thirst after you. That seems like that doesn't bless him too much. The psalmist in Psalm 42, 1 and 2 expresses what we're talking about. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God. To where you actually hunger and thirst to be righteous. That is, to be involved in righteousness. Of course, we're already counted as righteous through a faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, these qualities of character are what speak of Jesus' character. And he hungered and thirsted after righteousness. Not that he had to seek it because he was righteous. But what he means here is what he meant in his own case, that he hungered and thirsted after doing righteousness. And so his disciples... We're already counted as righteous through a faith in Christ. But do you have a hunger and thirst to be doing righteousness? You can be counted righteous, but when the Bible, and we taught you this in Old Testament theology, speaks of righteousness, it speaks of doing something. Not works to be justified, but because you are righteous, you do works of righteousness. Righteousness in the Old Testament is something you do. And that's said over and over. Do righteousness. Do mercy. Now, in verse 6, we have the spiritual counterpart to Matthew 6.33 that we've studied so often. What he says here is the spiritual counterpart of Matthew 6.33. There, seek first righteousness, which is found in the kingdom of God. And all of your material needs, your food and water, will be supplied you. You won't even have to take thought. 
Well, here he says, seek first righteousness and you will get what you seek. Righteousness. In other words, this is the spiritual counterpart of Matthew 6.33. In both cases, we are to seek righteousness. If we do, in the one case, we get material needs met. In this case, if we seek righteousness, we get righteousness. We get satisfied. Now, Jesus knew that we needed food and drink. That's the way he made us. You know, that's the way he made our bodies when he created us. And in Matthew 6.33, he says, These things that you hunger and thirst for to fulfill your essential needs, he says you will get as a byproduct of not seeking them, but seeking the kingdom, seeking righteousness. The reason so many are having financial struggles, so many are seeking the byproduct first. The food and the drink. If they would stop here on Matthew 5, 6, they'd get a message there that when they got over to 6.33, they would see that Jesus here says, Seek righteousness and you'll get righteousness. That hunger and thirst will be filled. Then when you get over to being hungry and thirsty physically, he says the same thing. Don't seek the byproduct of being in the kingdom. Those things are promised you. If you're his child. He said, don't even take a thought. Said it five times. Don't seek the byproduct. They automatically come to you if you seek what's over here in verse 6. Righteousness. In other words, we should get the message before we ever get over in chapter 6, verse 33 that we're always quoting. We should get the message right here. That he said the same thing there. You have to seek righteousness to get righteousness. But you also have to seek righteousness to get Not just your spiritual hunger and thirst satisfied, but your material one, or literal one. But the reason so many are struggling financially is because they're seeking the byproduct, which would make about as much sense as a farmer going out with his, what, three-gallon, five-gallon milk pail to milk the cow, then he would milk about a pint or two in the bottom of the bucket and then stir around looking for a pound of butter. And try another pint or so and stir around looking for a pound of butter. Well, the butter is the byproduct of the milk. And so the butter that you want on your table is the byproduct of not seeking the butter, but seeking the milk of God's word. And then the butter will be on your table, spiritually and literally or physically. And the sad part is, as we've taught so often, people have their priorities all mixed up. Seeking byproducts of the kingdom. It's interesting, he says here in Matthew 5, 6, as well as over in 6.33, That you're blessed if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. He did not say, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after food and drink. If they'll just have faith, they'll get those things. That proves you've got faith in God. He didn't say that. Are you spiritually hungry? He said, seek righteousness and uh, quench the hunger and thirst spiritually. Are you hungry and thirsty literally? Don't seek the byproduct of being in the kingdom. Seek the kingdom. Seek the righteousness of God. He says, I promise you, you'll get both. You'll get your spiritual hunger as well as your literal, physical hunger met. And it's because God cannot convince most professing disciples to stop seeking the byproduct, that which satisfies their physical needs, and seek the spiritual need to be met, is why so often they don't get either. You see, they've got all of these financial trials and troubles, they're in bondage to everybody, in debt, Christians I'm talking about, church members, professing Christians, because in seeking the byproduct, they don't even get that. That's why they're in trouble all the time. You know of what I speak. I suppose everybody here knows that financial route until they were taught the faith message. But we've stressed and still stress, the only way you'll get that is not seek it, but to seek the kingdom and his righteousness. Or to seek righteousness, because that's only to be found in the kingdom. Over Matthew 13 and verse 22, Jesus said in the parable of the sower, These that receive the seed in the stony ground are they who, because of the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, found that the word of God they heard was choked in their heart, and they become unfruitful. They were hearing the word, receiving the word, believing the word, because he implies they did. They received the seed, but it was in stony ground, shallow. And they allowed financial problems and needs to take first place in their heart. That choked the word, they became unfruitful. 
Now, I can testify from personal experience, if you'll give up the quest of seeking the byproduct, which the world and the church spends all of its time, all of its time, seeking first and generally last. If you'll give up the quest for the byproduct, you'll not only receive the byproduct, all of your material needs met, which results from being in the kingdom, but you receive the kingdom itself. You not only get the byproduct, the butter, but you get the milk. And some are missing the kingdom and they think they're in it because they're spending all their time seeking the byproduct. But since I closed my business, and I went off by faith, by the way, with nothing, haven't missed a meal, have the abundant life, I don't know what it is to owe anyone anything. I don't know what it is to have a material need. I've given up long ago seeking the byproduct and I get that automatically just because I'm seeking the kingdom. Now, some people seek around for six weeks or six months and say, I don't know why it works for him. It doesn't work for me. Well, I know why it works for me. And I know why it isn't working for them. It works for me. I'll give you three good reasons why. The first one is, is because I can't make it work for me. I learned long ago, 1952, I'd been trying to make it. I was going bankrupt. That's the way God reached me spiritually by taking away my central interests was to make a million dollars if I could and a name for myself. So the retail food market was the way, you know, that you could make the money and then I got into photography to make a name for myself. By the way, magazines were starting to accept some of my pictures. I did everything from bathing beauties to sausage factories, literally, you know, and get pictures printed in the sausage magazines. And I just started to be recognized. My slides were bought by a local photo finishing studio that used them in advertising and so forth. Just starting to make a name for myself. Then the bottom dropped out of the market. President Truman signed a bill that caused many businesses in Florida and elsewhere to go bankrupt. Now, that's another story I don't want to get into. We were in an ideal situation with our business around a lot of retirees living in trailers in St. Petersburg, Florida. And we were the only business around there that sold anything, that is, food. The closest store was downtown, I believe. And then... When he signed this bill, they started spending 50 cents to ride the bus to go to town to save a dime. They couldn't see the forest for the trees, but you couldn't get over, you know, and lecture them over in the trailer parks. They were all around us, but business stopped. And then I had this big order of pictures to a nightclub where I'd taken some publicity pictures, and I'd worked all week, had stacks of pictures. And this whole entertainment group had left town suddenly, you know, for whatever reason. There I was with stacks of pictures. And I was in debt. And I was so despondent and discouraged. And this has been going on two years. By the way, any other time I'd been in business in two or three places, you know, if I didn't like the way things were going financially, I'd just put it on the market and sold it just like that. A house, sell it just like that. And always double my money or whatever. Here I'm sitting two years and can't even get anyone, no one to look at it but the realtor. And he wasn't trying to buy it. He was going to sell it. Then after this debacle over at the nightclub and despondent on the way home, and I know the spot because when I'm in St. Pete, I say, there it is, where God said, that's far enough. He said, that's far enough. I said, Lord, if you'll show me what to do, I'll do it. I didn't know anything about faith. I didn't know anything about anything except what everybody's engaged in, seeking the byproduct. He sent a man in my business the very next day. I would said, show me what to do, Lord. I'll do it. That's the only prayer I knew how to pray, if you call that prayer. It was a prayer because he heard it. Sent a man in, asked for a donation for his church. I'd given him one the year or two before. You know, you always give donations. That helps your business. I said, I'm sorry. I just don't have it. And here came this man that God had sent. And he just looked right at me and he said, you go read Malachi 3, 8 to 11. Well, how do you know I even had a Bible? I didn't know. But I did have one. My father had given me years before and dusted it off. I mean, I heard the voice of the Lord through him. I read that and said, Will a man rob God? You've been robbing me. Robbing me of what? Of course, he's talking to Israel, but this way he's going to get to me, of his tithes and your offerings. Then I got over in chapter 4 and it talked about the wicked being burned up as stubble. And you talk about convicted. 
Then I got over in Matthew and found salvation and got saved. My wife got saved. And lo and behold, I started reading the Bible. Right away, it seems like God directed me right here in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, like right away. Matthew 6.33, seek righteousness. Seek the kingdom. You won't even have to take thought of your material needs. And that whole burden dropped off me like 10,000 tons. And the moment he saved me, I never sought the byproduct. Never had a worry. Never took a thought. Oh, I had to learn some things and grow. You know what I'm saying. But people couldn't understand. They would come in and church members, where we started going to church, like one couple come in and buy a big load of stuff on credit and then not pay you. And I thought, I didn't know Christians did this. I knew we had deadbeats like, you know, before I got saved, I had some. And those, I knock on the door, pay your bills, or you're going to court. You know, this is the way the world reacts. But when I got saved, praise the Lord. Bless them, Lord. They must need help badly to lie and steal because that's what they're doing. One good Baptist heard about that. He said, well, I was going to help you in college. You know, the Lord had called me to preach and I'd enrolled for college and was still trying to sell my business. He said, I was going to help you, but I'm not going to help. In effect, he said, a fool. Why, demand your rights. Sue them. Go collect. Turn it over to collection agency. I couldn't believe he was saying that. He was a Christian. I said, here it is, right here in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if they take your coat, give them your cloak. If someone borrows and doesn't pay it back, so what? Well, people right away couldn't understand anyone who took literally the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm saying, I discovered from the first, I couldn't do it. And that made me so happy because I already knew that. Two years of going bankrupt trying to sell a business and businesses going bankrupt all through the town. Bigger businesses than mine because of what had happened. The bottom dropped out of the economic market all over the country. I was just as happy though. It didn't matter because I knew he had called me to preach. I'd already been accepted in college. That's a miracle in itself. I was a high school dropout and got accepted. That's a miracle. Couldn't sell the business. Praising the Lord. Knew that he would provide. Three days before you matriculate in college. Now it takes three days to get from the middle of Florida up to Georgetown where I had enrolled. Right at the last minute he sent a man in, looked around said, I'll give you 500 for it. We see if you're not walking by faith, if you're seeking the byproduct, you've got problems. Because one piece of equipment would cost more than that. You couldn't literally start a lemonade stand for 500 today. It would cost you more to build one than that. It really would. 500 nothing. Oh, I was so happy because, you see, you can't lock a business up and leave the equipment in when you're leasing it. You've got to get that stuff out of there if you're going to leave. And anyway, I didn't care what he offered. I said, it's the Lord. I'll take it. Then he charged me $50 to haul my stuff off. So I only got 450 <laughs> Reduced from... Those days a new Hudson. (laughs) Man, I sound like much now, but back when those 1950 Hudsons came out, they were sleek. Reduced to a 1940 Plymouth. This is 52, 12 years old. Got to go all the way to college. $450 in your pocket. The 450 doesn't mean a thing because you're not seeking the byproduct. You've got the faith in your heart and you know he's going to provide right along the way. I said, this old Plymouth 1940, in the natural, (laughs) may not want to make it. But we've got the faith to get it from here to there and that was about 1,200 miles. And it did stop on the way. I mean, tried to stop. Nuts and bolts in a washing machine is what it sounded like. Smoke just rolling out of it. We just kept believing the Lord. We were nowhere when that started. Way up in Alabama. That's before the turnpikes. Nowhere. You can see for miles, nothing. But grass and road. And your car's quitting on you. And we just keep believing, keep believing. It finally limps into a garage. We had to stay in a motel because they took one look at it wouldn't even believe it to run. Pistons had disintegrated and things down in the manifold and exhaust. and They couldn't believe the car would run that way, but we knew that it could. Like I told that Baptist brother, if it tries to stop, God will keep it running. 
Oh, God doesn't heal motors. You better find you a garage. Well, he did heal it. He kept it patched up at least till it got there. The motel owners where we stayed, you know, we were just rejoicing in the Lord. Just been saved a few months and $450 in your pocket and a 40 Plymouth that's going to get fixed. And they knew there was something unusual and we found out they were Christians. We gave them our testimony and invited us in and fed us a big chicken dinner and called the garage and got the amount reduced to $75 to repair a motor that there wasn't anything left much to it. You could hardly buy a piston for 75 And on to college. With that repaired motor, still happy, still trusting the Lord. Faith, faith, faith. Didn't know any better. Just trust God. Matthew 6.33. Had never heard it in my life until I read it there. After I got in college, I found out no one else believed it. They were all professing Christians, you know. To the business manager, need a place to stay? He looks at you like you've lost your mind. College starts tomorrow. You get accepted six months ahead for an apartment, married student especially, with a family. There's nothing available except a couple of old trailers with the windows broken out up in the trailer park where the married student stayed that the dogs have been sleeping in and also using for a bathroom, we found out, after we got up there. And he sent us up there, this good Christian brother. Says, you can fix that up. Other students fix them up. I took one look. I said, I didn't come here to fix up a latrine. God has something better for us than that. So we got in the car, went down the middle of town, just parked it by the curb. Lord, you sent us here. We thank you for the provision. It wasn't long till the man came along, came over the car. Are you looking for a place to stay? Faith. I said, there are three reasons why it works for me. And they say, I don't know why it works for him. It doesn't work for me. Well, the first reason is I just stopped seeking the byproduct. I've been doing that for years. And just put it all in his hands. So he put us up in his trailer and fed us breakfast. The whole family hadn't taken ten steps out of his trailer the next day until a married student rushed up and said to him, but I'm standing there hearing it. I'm not coming back to school this semester. I've got a nice trailer over there. It turned out to be the second best in the trailer court. Big living room built on it with furniture in it. If you know anyone that wants it, they can have all the furniture for $20. The rent's only $20 a month. Do you know anybody that would be interested? Well, you know the end of that little scenario, don't you? So I rushed down to the business office and I told him when he said there's nothing available and all of that, I'd said to him the day before, God sent us here. And he'll provide a way. You'll see. He didn't answer that. His mouth fell open. The next day I rushed in. I said, I want to sign up for such and such a trailer, which was the second best in the trailer court. That is, that the college owned. A student that was affluent may have had a better one. That's not the point. And I said, see, I told you he'd provide. That's the first confession of faith I know he ever heard. He was, you know, a member in good standing at the big Baptist church in the college town. It was a Baptist college, religious, quite religious, quite Baptist, no faith. (laughs) He never said anything. I don't think I ever heard a word out of him after he heard my confession of faith the day before. So we signed up for that. The next year we got the best trailer and got it free. In that year, they saw I was walking by faith. I got a lot of criticism. Starving my family and all that. And God fed us abundantly. Never missed a meal. If you can call hamburger abundantly. But what I'm saying, we never missed a meal. Even always had the dessert. That's my English background coming through. It's not a meal without dessert. That includes breakfast. You have to have a roll with your egg and all that. So we didn't neglect the little goodies. The brother was graduating and he came over when he found out things did work for me and tuition did get paid and that we were healthy and God was providing the finances by faith, the faith they were criticizing. He begged me not to claim his trailer. He did. He said, brother, in that time, it was a lot of money. I've got a hundred or whatever it was, hundred, hundred fifty dollars invested in that. And it was nice. He had a beautiful room built on that college trailer, which they allowed you to do. It was the best place in the trailer court. I said, I've already claimed it. I've already signed up for it. 
But brother, I'll promise you one thing. You've got money invested in it. I won't do a thing to get it. I've just signed my name so that someone else doesn't come in and sign their name. Now, of course, I knew I had it. I didn't know anything about faith, principles, and conditions, all that. I just started believing the Word of God. And then later, after I got the Holy Spirit, I started analyzing what I'd been doing. And then you can put all of that in an order so others can practice that. You know, like five conditions to receive the promises of God. But I wasn't saying, uh, let's say I've met all the conditions. I've got your trailer. No, I just claimed it, signed up for it. That's faith acting. I said, I won't do a thing other than what I've done to get it. Now, you can feel sorry for him if you want, but it's God providing. He couldn't get anyone interested at all in it. So when he left college, and that's the way it is, whoever signed up for it got it, and you know who got it. We didn't have anything when we came. All possessions in the trunk. When we left, we had a moving van full and had to leave some of the furniture and didn't buy a penny's worth of anything. That's what he says. He says that if you will not seek the byproduct, your material needs, your furniture, your food and clothing and drink and tuition or whatever, you seek righteousness. And that's seeking the kingdom because that's where righteousness is. That's the only place it is. Now, the kingdom's in the world at this stage, remember, and we are citizens of the kingdom, so wherever a true citizen is, there is righteousness. And so, he provided. Came time to go to the seminary, no money, no job. Still had the 40 Plymouth. Had all this furniture. What are you going to do with it? Well, I went to Louisville and tried to, you know, find out what I could do. I thought, well, maybe even the Lord wants me to go to work. You know, it's not a sin to work and study at the same time. Although he provided abundantly through college. I did work that I could do and study like a night watchman. I didn't turn that down. Cleaning the bathrooms, my wife and I, and the washing machine room and that sort of thing. That paid the rent. Graded papers. I was the student assistant to the Bible professor. It was more a title than income. So I graded papers in the Bible department for 25 cents an hour. And most people today won't even stoop to pick a quarter up off the street because... <laughs> Oh, whew, it's probably dirty. That's literally true. I see little kids going and getting their change. You go in the pizza house. They'll pull this money out of their pocket, and they're not hardly big enough to see the names on the jukebox, the titles. And there they are just pouring quarter after quarter into that monster so that they can listen to that junk. You know the story. But there it all was. And so I said, well, nothing has opened, so the Lord wants me to go because first year in college I claimed a doctor's degree and you can't get that in college, you know, not Georgetown. It's not a university. You get that in universities. So it had to be at seminary. So I said, I'll go up and sleep in the car if I have to, which I did, although friends put me up. But I was prepared to sleep in the car. I had the $60 to matriculate with, went and matriculated. Paid my $60, signed up for all these courses, could already see myself really growing, you know, in the Word. I learned later you had to do your own study because they were so liberal they didn't believe anything. But at least I had a Bible and I was introduced to authors and subjects and things that you wouldn't be on your own. But, oh, I was so happy. I was entering the seminary. All I've got is a 40 Plymouth up there I'm living out of. I didn't try to figure how he'd work it out. But while I'm matriculating by faith, not worrying about how he's going to work it out, all I'm required to do is sign up like I'm going to go. Another tap on the shoulder, like that person you know that came over the car said, Are you looking for a place to stay? I don't know how he knew we were looking for a place to stay or need a place that night. God told him. Tap on the shoulder. Are you looking for a job? I had been looking for one. Couldn't find anything. The Lord didn't want me to have those jobs. He said, I'll tell you where there's an opening, you don't have to do anything. And you get paid. Get all your meals, you get a monthly check, get your laundry done, you have an apartment. Well, that appealed to me because I wanted to study. <laughs> I knew it was the Lord because that enabled me to study. Because, you know, I spent 16 hours a day, seven days a week. By the way, in college, I pastored little churches and supplied pulpits. You know, I wasn't sitting around saying, no, Lord... Matthew 6.33 says you'll provide, so I'm not going to do anything till I get that diploma, and then I'll do what you say. But I did what would not interfere with my studies, because he sent me to study was the point. I was 32 then. 
1952, you can figure it out yourself. When you're 32, you don't have 10 years to get through college like some took. And so I went and applied for the job. He says, fine, it's yours. If your wife can pass a test, because it was civil service in those days, it was working for the state, which, of course, we don't do now, but the point is, you grow, remember, as you get light. And said, there are two women that don't fit the qualifications. You two do. You will be house parents, so we're delinquent children. And see, this would give me a place to stay, the family, provide food and a salary every month and laundry, everything. And I had a big office that I could study. I didn't even have to stick my head out the door except to act like a daddy for all the girls and my own family, which I trust I did. But... He said, there are two women who have made a 93, so your wife will have to make more than that. We're still talking about faith. So I called on the phone back to Georgetown. I said, we've got a job. The Lord's provided this fantastic thing. And the brother here is going to borrow a truck here at the children's home. And we're going to come up there and get the furniture and put the kids in the car and come on. And you need to stop by Lexington, Kentucky, the state capital, and take a civil service exam because that's required. And then I said... Then come on, we've got the job. See, I didn't tell her she needed a 93. Or <laughs> you know, I'm still just as naive that if it's faith, that settles the question. And if you're moving in God's will, first of all, and you have to know that. If you don't know, then there are ways to find out. There's a book around here somewhere in this pulpit called How to Know God's Will. You have to take the time to read it and put it in practice. Don't frown when we say 75 pages to make... A decision whether or not I should marry that girl? Well, you might wish you had read it, but... <laughs> you can call it dumb if you want. Never thought about it not working. And the superintendent said, have them call the grade to me after they grade your paper. Before she got there, they'd already called it in. 97. You had to make a 93 because they have to take whoever makes the highest grades or not take anybody. And of course, as I always say, which blesses her. <laughs> he let her miss three to keep her humble. <laughs> she only needed 94, but he gave her a 97. I don't know if you've ever taken a civil service exam. It's like any exam under pressures and the kids out in the hot sun and in the car and Pam taking care of the two little ones. And you could have all that pressure on, but faith doesn't have any pressure. So we'll stop there tonight. Sometime I'll give them a testimony. <laughs> but <laughs> why does it work for me? It works for him. Why doesn't it work for me? Because I knew it couldn't work for me. So I just quit trying. Because if I sought the byproduct, which I'd been doing all those years before I got saved, then I'd be putting last things first, and that can never work. You've got to put the first things first. Seek first the righteousness and the kingdom of God. Another reason why it works for me and not others is because I met the conditions. I've been talking about those. That's Matthew 6. Five times, don't worry, don't take a thought. I met those conditions. And thirdly, it's because I take literally Mark 10. It works because he says there, if you do what we've described, forsake it all, I'll give it back a hundredfold in this life. And in the life to come, you get eternal life. For any skeptics that might hear this, you better read Mark 10. He says he'll give you houses and lands, material things in this life if you don't seek those things. If you give them up, then he says, I'll give them to you a hundredfold in this life and in the world to come. He contrasts that with the spiritual life, the eternal life. I believe that. And I can honestly say he has literally done that. If you would take what I could have sold the business for, say, at a reasonable figure, in those days that would be quite a considerable sum for a no larger business than I had, but if you could take that, and I had been able to sell it for what I was probably asking, God has restored that a hundredfold, and then some. 
So all the passages we've given you, Matthew 6, Matthew 13, Mark 10, are really setting forth one principle. That if you seek first things first, God will supply the second things. The byproduct. But you don't understand. Someone says. It's not like you. You see, you can believe God and you're not on a fixed income like I am. And he can just cause people to send you money or give more in the offering or whatever. But I'm limited to what my employer wants to give me down at the bakery. I work down at the bakery and you see, that's my income. I'm limited to what they want to pay me. Did you know I work down at the bakery too? And that I'm limited to what my employer wants to give me? Yeah, I work at the bakery. The Lord has given me a job baking bread out of the ingredients that He's given me, which you call the Bible. The ingredients are all there and he has said, now after you bake it with these ingredients, then go serve it. And if you'll do that, you won't even have to take thought about your bread if you'll serve my bread. You're working at the bakery. You're limited. You're only limited to the extent of your faith. We're both working for the same employer. In fact, you've got a fixed income and then you can believe on the side. I don't have a fixed income. <laughs> Mine is solely on the side, which praise God. It's the big side of it all. Father, in Jesus' name, help your disciples to see the importance of seeking first things first. Not the byproducts, which you said just come automatically because we're your children. We won't have to seek them, won't have to take thought for them. But to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we'll be filled not only with Righteousness, but with the byproduct, all of our needs will be met. Oh, and work in us a spirit of meekness and humility. Help us to be lowly of spirit like our teacher, Jesus. In this end time, may all of these qualities of his character be manifest in those of us who are created in his image. For I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.